So welcome to the next talk of the day. I will, um, this talk cover um, efficient data storage for the blockchain. So we'll be looking into data dispersal, data retrieval, and data availability sampling. So at a high level, the picture that I want you to have in mind um, before, um, for, for, for the duration of the talk, that I'll be uh, talking about different aspects of it, of it, is it, is this. So we're gonna try to build a system uh, that will basically handle reliable um, storage of data. So the setup here is that we have um, Alice and she wants to store her file on the network of servers. What she's gonna do is she's gonna distribute her file to this network such that the network stores potentially some pieces of the files, um, maybe with some replication, such that um, even if some servers in this network become malicious and go Byzantine, uh, still they cannot hurt the retrieval process. So Bob will later on come to retrieve Alice's file. She will ask this network of servers uh, for the fragments of this file and should be able to reconstruct uh, Alice's file back from the network even if some nodes fail and or become Byzantine. All right, so that's the high level motivation. Alice will disperse the file and Bob will later on can come and retrieve the file. And this can be completely different users. They cannot share any secrets between themselves. So we will be looking into sort of making the system very efficient. So we'll minimize communication and also storage cost, uh, but to maximize the number of Byzantine nodes that the system can safely, safely handle. Okay, naive solution would be of course to do full replication. So Alice just sends a copy of her file to all of the servers and then Bob can query as long as the majority of the replies come back with the same file, he can assume this what what Alice shared. But we'll do much, much better than full replication. So before we kind of dive into solutions for this particular like complicated protocols with dispersal, uh, retrieval, some agreement between the servers, I want to motivate the problem from the blockchain perspective. Okay. So I'll spend uh, quite a, some time first motivating why, why this problem is important for blockchains. Okay, so let's look at practical motivation for the distributed storage from the block, uh, blockchain perspective. It's kind of an interesting problem on its own, right? Uh, but uh, in blockchain, it's, uh, I'll show you why, why we want this to be like, extremely efficient, why we ideally want this uh, to be available, solutions to be available today for that. So as you might heard, and probably you hear, keep hearing this for already a number of years, that the blockchain struggle to scale, and that's still the case. So, uh, but at least now we have some concrete path forward to how to fix the situation. At least like we, we now have a plan. Before we had ideas, now we have a concrete plan. But the problem right now is that still our Bitcoin network, for example, it only can confirm seven transactions a second, so that, um, the blockchain creates about one megabyte block every 10 minutes, and Ethereum is not much better than that. It's about 15 transactions per second, uh, with a slightly a small, uh, with a smaller block. That, um, uh, but the blocks are appearing more frequently. So it's a 80 kilobytes uh, block per 12 seconds. So that's about four megabytes per 10 minutes. If you are to, com to compare Bitcoin and Ethereum in terms of throughput, uh, you have one megabyte per 10 minutes versus four megabytes per 10 minutes on average, roughly. But all of that is nothing uh, compared to Visa that can handle thousands of transactions per second. So blockchains are nowhere near that uh, number. Yeah, and again, this is kind of on the right. This is a picture explaining why we're focusing on Bitcoin and Ethereum for most of our talks here. It's because those are the major cryptocurrencies um, that we have today. So why blockchain struggle to scale fundamentally like at its core that's because everybody is doing everything there's a huge amount of replication effort going on it, you can think of it as if the blockchains were designed for this catastrophic scenarios that all of the nodes can fail and completely disappear at least if, if at least one node kind of remains to be running the blockchain and holds all of the historical transactions the blockchain will survive so the blockchains are really designed to survive catastrophic scenarios of all except one node crash falling. Um, but today we know that the blockchain really should only survive 30% uh, Byzantine faults. 
So the kind of the philosophical high level idea is that instead of full replication, why don't we do you know 66.6% .6 replication such that not every single node can reconstruct the full thing, but 66% of the nodes should be able to recover the blockchain state, state instead of a single node. So that's kind of the philosophy behind why we should be able to scale the blockchains. Uh, so the path towards uh, getting there is um, kind of uh, first goes through mod some modularization. You look at what kind of replicated work the nodes are doing for the blockchain. So let's kind of break it down into two components and then we'll see how to optimize each individual components. So each node running the blockchain is doing two things. It's uh, storing transactions and then it's also executing these transactions. And we will um, sort of... Uh, talk about two approaches, uh, data availability solutions that I'm going to present next are, will be dealing with storing transactions, but to motivate that I will explain how first we scale uh, the execution. So the way to scale execution, at least it's widely believed to be so now uh, for Ethereum blockchain, uh, is to use uh, rollups, to rely on rollups. So what is a rollup? Now I give you like <laughs> ten, five minutes uh, fresh course on rollups. Uh, I hope it makes sense at the end, but um, ask me questions uh, if it doesn't. So the blockchain, again, is this really simple uh, sort of conceptually model that all the users are submitting transactions, the transactions are getting ordered, packed inside the block, and the next block gets uh, appended to the blockchain. Then again, the users send transactions, they're packed in the block, appended to the blockchain. So semantically, of course, users are transacting with each other. I'm simplifying a little bit. Of course, on Ethereum, there are smart contracts that are doing cross-contract calls, but that's essentially the accounts are, inter are interacting and doing calls or sending money. Um, so you can you know, take a subset of accounts and kind of um, move, try to move the transactions that they do off-chain. So let's see what happens if you introduce a central server who will just take all the transactions of these users um, and then submit a resulting transaction. Kind of, It will subsume the transactions on the right and will um, put on chain only the resulting transactions, the transactions that appear on the left here to the blockchain. Okay, so it, the users will be s sending these transaction to, transactions to the rollup and the rollup will only kind of tra transact out uh, on behalf of these users. Um, so you might think, uh, if you haven't seen rollups before, your first impression should be like, isn't this a horrible idea? Because uh, isn't the whole purpose of the blockchain to be decentralized and now we're introducing the central party, so why are we doing that? Uh, so in fact, rollups are engineered in such a way that they cannot cheat. Um, in fact, rollups uh, have these two components, a smart contract that's actually written on chain, you can see what it's doing, and um, a coordinator, a service. So the rollup smart contract guarantees uh, kind of the correct behavior of, the, uh, of itself, of the coordinator. And coordinator is just a facilitator to the smart contract. It does uh, some pre-processing on, on uh, the transactions, but it's fully autonomous. If the coordinator goes away, uh, Hopefully it can be, so it, the rollups are engineered in such a way that it can be replaced um, and the users uh, can always rely on themselves. If the rollup goes down, they can always substitute it and run the rollup uh, coordinator themselves to help them transact out of the rollup. So in more, um, in slightly more details, um, here we rely either on snark proofs or uh, fraud proofs. I'll explain what that uh, what distinction is in just a second. But what the rollup is going to do conceptually is going to prove that it knows a valid uh, right list of transactions that result in a left list of transactions. So the right list of transactions are happening off chain, and the uh, left list is, is going to be submitted on chain by the rollup, by the rollup coordinator. Yeah? Um, so. It's important to keep in mind what the rollups can and cannot do to make sure we're not hurting uh, decentralization with this uh, new approach. So rollups really cannot steal funds because they are proving that they have a valid list of transactions on the right. They really cannot cook up any new transactions and can transact on behalf of users for which they don't know the secret keys. So they cannot steal funds, but what the rollups can do is they can censor 
they can ignore transactions from some users, but the roll-up smart contract is set up in such a way that the users always have the possibility of going on-chain and kind of surpassing the roll-up altogether and transacting out of the roll-up if, uh, if they're not satisfied with its service, okay? So if the roll-up starts censoring them, users can always go on-chain. And uh, the second thing, the second bad thing that can happen, the roll-up can go down. Uh, you know, it's not being malicious, uh, nothing, it's not censoring, but it's just, I don't know, it's a crash fault and it, uh, it disappears. <coughs> then anybody should be able to restore the state of the rollup and transact out of the rollup, okay? And this will re require one crucial thing, that the transaction, tra all of the transactions that your rollup ever did are available somewhere so that you can get those transactions uh, and restore the state of the rollup and basically replace its function. And this is really crucial that there, sh that there is a place that these off-chain transactions are stored. Um, it's also very interesting to look at um, the rollups that are running today and what are their transaction fees because fees are a really good indication of whether we are improving scalabil scalability or not. Right, so if the fees uh, go down, it means uh, you know everything becomes more efficient for everybody. So uh, that's really a good indication. And for rollups, um, so this is the table kind of showing different uh, rollups sending simple ETH or swapping tokens, and um, that's comparing it to the kind of cost in Ether. So if you're transacting through a rollup, your gas cost for sending simple transfers is much lower. It's about two to thirty uh, x lower gas cost. So roll-ups are really help us scale, so that we are moving in the right direction, right? Um, so going back to our kind of high-level picture, there will eventually be some users who are transacting directly on the Ethereum blockchain and some who are transacting through a roll-up. And uh, hopefully there will be a nice, um, this already is, but hopefully it will maintain the nice ecosystem of different roll-ups. Um, that are kind of subsuming transactions of their users and instead of uh, submitting Instead of users submitting their complicated transactions on chain directly, they submitted uh, through a rollup. Okay, so the total number of transactions is actually large, but the transactions that the number of transactions that hit the chain is uh, is much smaller. Okay, so fewer transactions hit the chain, yet there are more transactions happening actually in total. You just not necessarily you know they they, they don't uh, put bur much burden on the blockchain. So. To be a little more precise, uh, rollup state is a Merkle root of all of the rollup account states, and the transaction that the rollup is submitting on behalf of the users contains, you know, the on-chain list of transactions. These are you know, external calls external to the rollup or transfers out of the rollup. Uh, there is a commitment uh, to this off-chain list of transactions that uh, the rollup knows, but uh, it kind of subsumes, yeah? And there is a, a, an optional proof pi that basically shows that the off-chain list of transactions is corresponds to the on-chain list of transactions. Um, it can be there, then it's called a ZK rollup because we are using zero knowledge proofs to prove that rollups doesn't cheat, or it can be empty, um, and then we rely on fraud proofs, the so-called optimistic rollups then. So um, if you rely, on fraud proofs, basically, you rely on clients raising a dispute if they see that, trans that the rollup misbehaves and is submitting some fishy transactions that are not consistent, don't have good signatures, whatever. So the clients will be able to raise a dispute if the rollup is engineered without the zero knowledge uh, proof component. Okay, so there's always um, a way to replace the rollup as long as you know the off-chain list of transactions and you can reconstruct the rollup uh, state, okay? Because the smart contract only stores the Merkle root of rollups account state, but in order to prove the correct execution, you need the full rollup state. To get it, you need to get the full list of past transactions and replay it and reconstruct the rollup. Okay, it can take some time. But in principle, rollup can, you know, can be a single entity just to make sure that you can quickly bootstrap a new rollup. If this rollup goes down, you might want uh, to run multiple of them in parallel. Great. So um, let's look a bit closer into the soft chain transaction list. 
it's kind of special type of data that we now want to store in the blockchain because no execution is done over this data. You know, we um, off-chain transactions simply need to be stored and the network should agree that it stores this off-chain list of transactions and that um, they match with the commitment. I should have highlighted the commitment here. Uh, that's important. So the network should agree that they're storing the transactions and that the commitment to this transaction is what's written uh, on, 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 inside the block. Okay, so that's uh, kind of introducing a new special type of storage that is guaranteed to not be required for execution. Uh, so here comes the idea. If it's not required for execution, maybe we shouldn't replicate it. You know, maybe we should store it in a distributed way, kind of dispersed among the servers, because, sure, you continue kind of replicating execution, at least for those transactions that hit the chain, but since this data is not required for execution, you know, maybe you can split it um, around the nodes and make them just run some agreement protocol to make sure that they store it consistently and well. Um, and just to also illustrate why this is such an important topic for rollups, it's also instructive to see what rollups are paying for. So when, when you're transacting through a rollup, where your gas fees go? And this is a very nice graph from one of the rollups showing that about 90% of gas fee that you still pay, it's still, it's still cheaper than transacting in Ethereum, but um, out of that small, already small gas fee, 90% goes to data storage, okay, this is blue uh, column, and then only about 10% goes to actual execution. So if we can scale the data storage, if we make it much, much cheaper, we will reduce the gas cost for users even uh, lower. All right, so this is the motivation. I hope it made some sense <laughs> for why we want uh, to do distributed data storage for Ethereum. Cool. Not, not just for Ethereum, any blockchain can benefit from that if it adopts this uh, kind of roll-up yes, centric approach. Yeah? All right, so la now let's look into theory of uh, how to build solutions for um, data storage. And that goes back to the 80s again. So uh, we will look into the protocols called information dispersal algorithms. Uh, these are really two protocols that I explained in the beginning. The dispersal protocol, so the client sends a file to this IDA system of servers, and the file is redundantly encoded, split into fragments, and stored on the nodes. And then there is a retrieval protocol where Bob, say, comes along, and uh, it queries a bunch of servers, uh, getting some fragments. It should be able to uh, stick the fragments together and reconstruct uh, the file that Alice was storing there. So let me be a little bit more formal and can define the four properties. These are the standard properties you'll see in the literature if you, look, uh, if you start reading about information dispersal algorithms. So let me kind of go over them. Uh, those four are termination. So if the disperser was honest, all honest servers should complete successfully. Okay. There is agreement, so either all honest servers eventually complete or none of them. So regardless of the honesty of the disperser, they all should agree on the, uh, whether the dispersion was successful or not. And then if the dispersion was successful, we, can, we consider it successful if F plus one uh, honest servers complete the dispersal. F here is the number, uh, is, an up, is a bound on the number of Byzantine servers and we assume the total number of servers is 3f plus 1. Okay, this is this usual kind of Byzantine assumptions that you're assuming a third can be dishonest, um, but that uh, at the end of the successful dispersion, f plus 1 uh, servers actually, s plus 1 honest servers actually store the data. So if f plus 1 servers store the data, you need availability, so the client who is retrieving uh, the file from this um, system should be should eventually reconstruct something. Okay, it should not reconstruct some error at the at the end. It should reconstruct some file, and correctness saying that um, all on, all um, retrievers either reconstruct the same file. So we also need agreement on the retrievers that they're reconstructing the same thing. Should not uh, we shouldn't have any discrepancies. And uh, if an honest client disperses the file, then what we reconstruct is the same as what uh, the honest disperser uh, was storing in the system, okay? So basically it says uh, at a high level that the system is correct and 
It consists. It keeps, keeps its consistency even if the disperser was malicious and was distributing some garbage fragments. Um, but it should correctly behave if the disperser was uh, uh, was honest. Okay. So this problem was formulated already in 1989 by Michael Robin. I think this was the first paper kind of uh, suggesting a plausible construction, and. Uh, that's the design that kind of still with us today. So I'm going to go into this design, explain how it works, and then explain how we improved it recently um, um, and the, how it's becoming better. All right, so Michael also coined the term IDA. So if you uh, look into the literature, this is like becoming a term like MPC. Like you say MPC, everybody knows what you're talking about. And now, now this kind of IDA. People will know that this information dispersal algorithm, a useful acronym to know. And the idea high level there is that um, you erase your code your file, and then you send pieces of this encoded file to different nodes. So let me give you a really quick kind of overview of erasure coding. It's not that complicated. The erasure codes that I use here are extremely, extremely simple. It's, uh, you don't need uh, to take a coding class to kind of understand what's going on. I hope uh, I will be able to kind of explain it simply. So the file that uh, the disperser is going to store, let's assume that it's just a vector of integers modulo p. Okay, you just split up your file and uh, pretend that it's a vector of size m of integers mo modular some prime p. We'll assume that we have some matrix G of size n times m, where n is larger than m, such that if you take any m rows of G, you make up a full rank matrix. So what it means, if you take any, any m rows of G are linearly independent. So if you uh, take you know, any square sub-matrix of G, you get an invertible matrix as a result. And I'll show you some uh, good matrices that satisfy this property, but for now, let's just assume that uh, you know, this magic G has this magic property. So erasure coding will be super simple. It's just a linear function. It takes um, the file, so it takes the vector x, multiplies it by g, and it expands it now from size m to size n. So it becomes a large vector, y. Okay, and y is what um, the elements of y is what our servers are going to be storing. Okay, so we have n servers, each of them storing one fragment of this y, eventually. But uh, yeah, so y is called the code word. It's an, an encoding, a redundant encoding of x. So why is it in redundant encoding of x? Well, if you lose some elements from your y, as long as you still have m elements in y, uh, you can do the reconstruction by uh, inverting your matrix and uh, just basi basically solving a linear system. So just let's quickly walk through an example. Uh, let's assume our matrix G is five times three matrix, okay? And our vector is just three elements. So our file is just three uh, numbers modulator prime, so we multiply our x by g, we expand it into five element vector, and now the reconstruction says that as for this, for this matrix, yeah, it will, um, it will say if you're losing some elements of y, for example, you're losing two elements out of five, so you're still left with three elements there in y, you just, uh, you know, erase the corresponding rows of the matrix g, um, yeah, those are those are erasure codes, they correct for erasures. So if you're not having some elements of Y, you erase corresponding elements of uh, your vector G, okay, you squash it into a square matrix, and now you need to find X, okay? You need to reconstruct back your file. So you just multiply by G inverse uh, on both sides and you get back Y, or we'll get back X. Okay, so how to pick uh, this magic matrix? Uh, Remember, the property that we need is that any m rows of G constitute an invertible matrix. So if you have a large prime, if you're working in a large enough field, then actually, surprisingly, random matrix would just work. Yeah, random matrices are invertible with high probability, but they're very expensive to invert. So you can use the random matrix, no problem, but computing this G inverse Sorry, this is G inverse on the right. Computing this G inverse is going to be very expensive. Yeah, you need to do full inversion. Um, it's, it, yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, it's more than quadratic time algorithm, so 
that's expensive. And we know how to do it much better with the other types of matrix uh, called Vandermond matrix. Uh, and it gives Reed Solomon erasure code. So the Vandermond matrix G that we're going to be using, that, that are used in these contractions, are uh, um, you know, very simple matrices. Uh, they uh, take consecutive numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and they raise it to consecutive powers, yeah? Um, you take this uh, elements uh, to the power zero, then el this elements to the power one, the elements to the power two, and you continue, okay? You can generate this way a matrix of any size. And this matrix, these matrices have this magic property that any, um, you know, in this case, um, any three rows of this matrix are linearly independent. There is also um, the, uh, the way to see that these matrices have uh, much better performance than random matrices is to actually notice that those are polynomial evaluations. And this is going to be important later on because we will use this property that those are not just uh, you know, mat matrices with this magic property, but those correspond to polynomial evaluations. So why is that? So you, matri you can treat your file as a vector of uh, coefficients, yeah? a0, a1, a2. And you can think of uh, this file representing a polynomial f of x, um, yeah, quadratic polynomial with these coefficients. And then when you multiply these coefficients by the van der Mond matrix, as a result, you get actually evaluations of this polynomial at these points. Okay, you get evaluations at one, evaluations at point two, evaluations at point three, and so on. So erasure coding actually boils down in this case to polynomial evaluation. And then reconstruction is the opposite operation. Yeah, it's polynomial interpolation. You are uh, reconstructing your coefficients from the evolutions. And we know extremely efficient algorithms. Uh, if you, you 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 will use not like one, two, three, uh, four, five, but you'll use uh, powers of the root of unity. But so it's it's enough to have just distinct elements. Any distinct elements here will do for the roots of unity. We know especially efficient algorithms to do transformation back and forth. So n log n algorithm. You don't need to invert your matrix. Uh, great. So these are um, erasure code. This, this is a concrete erasure code we're going to be using. So now you may ask, okay, how about if I if my file is much much larger? If I really store a lot of data on the blockchain? So the number of um, rows in the resulting Y should be exactly the number of nodes uh, in my in the system that stores my file, okay? Because I will give one fragment to each of the nodes. So the number of rows in Y should be proportional to N. I have uh, no freedom in choosing that, okay? That's uh, just given to me by the network that will be storing the file, but I have the freedom to choose the length of my uh, rows, okay? And that's how I will be storing larger files. So instead of, you know, before we were looking into single elements in X, now we can look into actual long vec uh, row vectors, okay? So our file will be just a bunch of uh, uh, long vectors. So this, is, this just gives you a way to storing uh, files of arbitrary size. All right, so here is the um, erasure coding IDA um, by Michael Rabin. You take your file, you, sp uh, you split it um, into fragments, okay? So you encode it as a matrix. Um, so for example, if these are three fragments, you will be able to reconstruct from any three servers. And you multiply it by your matrix G to split it, to encode it for five servers now and you give each server one fragment. Yeah, so the retriever then will be asking those servers to give the fragments back because it wants to reconstruct Alice's file. And uh, as long as the system has only crash faults as, and uh, at least three uh, correct servers are storing your fragments, you can piece back the matrix together and reconstruct the file. The problem with the system is that the can only tolerate crash faults, only 50% crash faults. So now we're gonna make it better and uh, improve it to tolerate Byzantine faults as well. And for that, we will need a little bit of uh, uh, better machinery. And uh, you know, this was simple stuff so far. It's, it's gonna maintain simple, but it's gonna be slightly more complicated. So uh, we will use homomorphic vector commitments. We know multiple ways of how to build them. Uh, so I'm not going to focus on constructions. Uh, there are different trade-offs. 
but essentially the, uh, the commitment scheme is deterministic. We don't need any hiding here, just the binding property. So the commitment allows you to commit to a vector of elements in ZP, and they homomorphic, they're homomorphic in the sense that this property holds. You can add two commitments together. As a result, this will be exactly equal to the commitment of the sum. And you can generalize this commitment to matrices, so you can commit to a matrix M row-wise, so commitment to a matrix will be a column vector of commitments. Other question? Why would you not use error-correcting codes, Amazing uh, idea, yes. You can use error-correcting codes, unfortunately, because of the subtle problems, you won't be able to make them work. Um, well, they, they, yeah. You can improve the system with error correcting codes. This will not get you to the full, uh, the system that satisfies all of the properties, so you, you still need uh, something like that at the end. But error correcting, that's a good idea, yeah. I was thinking of covering that, but uh, you can try offline about error correcting. Uh, yeah, it's a great idea too. Uh, great, so you can generalize your commitments to matrices and commit to the matrix row wise, and then this the relation is going to hold, yeah? So you can multiply your commitment, which is now a um, column vector, by a matrix, and it will be equal to the commitment of G times the matrix, okay? Everything uh, is nice and homomorphic here, so the matrix uh, kind of matrix goes inside the commitment. So now what we're going to do is uh, the disperser, Alice, is going to commit to her file first. So she will going to um, create this uh, vector, column vector commitment H, and then she's going to encode the file uh, using our usual method by multiplying by the matrix G. So G times F gives you Y. And also, uh, kind of implicitly, uh, your, the commitments to the resulting vector Y also satisfy this relation. Okay, so um, you can commit this, you can compute these commitments either by multiplying H by G, or you can recommit to Y and you're guaranteed to get the same result. Okay, so you kind of can always restore C from H. So now Alice will send, uh, as before, all the fragments uh, to the servers, but she will also send this um, uh, commitment to the whole file. And each of the servers will basically check that they're getting the fragment that is consistent with the file. Uh, the way they do it is they expand this column vector into C, Okay, using this homomorphic property, and then they check, they recommit to the vector y and check that they get the correct entry in the resulting uh, commitment c. Okay, so at least the servers kind of get an idea of whether they're uh, storing um, correct fragment, fragment that corresponds to the commitment or not. And then it can be the job of the retriever to figure out what the correct commitment should be. So it should query all of those, re all of those servers, figure out what's the majority vote on H. Okay, H is small, it's, uh, it, it can, mm, you know, query, it's okay to query um, multiple servers for H, it will take the majority vote, figure out what's the right H, and then it, based on this H, it will basically filter out incorrect Ys. So if the malicious server sends you bogus Y, you will just ignore it because it doesn't match uh, your commitment H. Okay, now uh, you're again to this error correcting, sorry, erasure coding method where you can uh, basically correct for those erasures for the servers that are sending you inconsistent things. Although the servers can be arbitrary malicious, but you are still kind of reducing this case to erasure coding uh, case of Michael Raven, okay? So you piece together back uh, your correct fragments and then you reconstruct as before. All right, so this is one method. There are many, many more, like you can use homomorphic commitments, you can use also other stuff uh, for this uh, to work. You can, um, you can do hashing with some full replications or some of the early protocols, but um, discussion to sorrow, but um, it's uh, very heavy on the communication side. There are interesting information theoretic methods uh, using homomorphic fingerprinting. Instead of uh, using heavyweight cryptography with uh, homomorphic commitments, you can use homomorphic fingerprinting based on universal hashing and also um, make them work. So it's slightly worse communication than with some of the most efficient uh, commitment schemes that we know today, but uh, it's very nice construction called Avid FP. Um, there's ideas of using Merkle hashing, but with Merkle hashing, it's kind of a challenge 
to verify that uh, you did the encoding correctly. So this method uh, using Oracle hashing will require uh, the retriever to check the consistencies. I won't go, I won't go into the details. There are also methods uh, yeah, to use homomorphic commitments. Yes? Yeah, just the succinctness and the binding, yeah, not the hiding. You can, yeah, that's an interesting question of how to bootstrap the system to also maybe hide the data, but we're not asking it here, yeah. Uh, in this solution, no, but we'll see another solution where they do. Yeah, I'll get there. Cool. Yes? Um, can't you just uh, store the hashes in, in the blockchain? Check the, 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 the pieces that you get back to mm -hmm. the hashes that were stored in the blockchain? Yeah, exactly. You can use the blockchain, but we will try to bootstrap the system from scratch. So we will kind of at the end you will see how to build blockchain solely for data storage. But uh, you, yeah, sure, if you already have a blockchain, uh, you can use uh, the consensus mechanism from there, uh, yeah, to help you build this, but cool. Um, yeah, so now this is very, uh, this is non-interactive, okay? So the servers actually do not re reach agreement around whether they're storing the file or not at the end of the day. Um, but why do you need agreement? For some applications, you might not need agreement. It's okay for a retriever to, um, you know, query multiple servers and kind of make up his own mind of whether their network is storing the file or not. Um, but really, the place where you need uh, the servers to reach agreement is when you want to build a system where users can atomically pay the servers for data storage. Okay, so I want to basically send a transaction saying, I want, please store this data underneath this commitment and uh, the network will reach agreement around whether they have successfully stored the data that they can now charge me uh, for storing this data um, and I can get back the confirmation uh, from them. They will basically sign the commitment for me saying that they are storing this data. So to make sure that they all agree on whether they need to charge me or not, or whether will be based on whether they're storing the data uh, consistently or not, so they need to reach agreement on whether they store the data. So that's really why you need the uh, idea with agreement is if you want to bake incentives in and you want uh, to really users be paying servers uh, and build it into a nice blockchain system where yeah, you can line incentives up. So it's almost the same problem as state machine replication. It's very, very similar. You can, uh, if you already have state machine replication, you can use that, um, except you need uh, reliable information dispersal. So there is a small tweak to the uh, kind of SMR consensus that you do um, to turn it into the reliable information dispersal. I, I'll try to explain it, um, but essentially, out of the system, you, was, you want correctness and agreement. Those are the two protocols of the blockchain, like liveness and availability, yeah? So correctness says that if sender is honest and send H to the network of servers, all honest nodes uh, should uh, output H, so should agree that they, um, yeah, should, should agree on what they store, like what, the, what commitment they store, um, if they should, the system should also achieve ag agreement, so either all nodes store output of the same age or none of them. So, okay, so there is a, a safety, a basically safety and liveness conditions, and there is also an availability, an additional one. So we're saying that if an honest node output age, saying that I actually store the correct fragments underneath this age, then at least a third of honest nodes are storing correct fragments, okay? So we want this property that the, if one node think, thinks that, uh, the dispersion, the dispersal was correct, and one third, um, then one third of nodes should actually be storing the fragments. Okay, so at the high level, like we were looking into this ID um, algorithms without agreement between the servers. This was highly non-interactive. Alice was sending something to the servers, and then Bob was retrieving, no interaction. And now, of course, to reach agreement, they you need to make the servers talk to each other, and so you turn this real simple protocol and now it's kind of quite complicated. So um, to bootstrap it into, 
you know, a system that will reliably store data, you actually need to, uh, to run reliable broadcast style uh, consensus for data dispersion. I will not go into the too much details here. You can look in the slides in more detail to see what uh, actually is going on there. Basically, Alice is sending her fragments to the servers, and then the servers engage in two rounds of communication in order to agree on whether they store the fragments correctly or not. So at the end, if any of them reaches commit, it, is, uh, it reaches the final stage here, it is guaranteed that at least F plus one honest nodes are storing correct fragments that are consistent with H. And at the end also, uh, you get a signature um, from two F plus one nodes that can serve as a proof of storage. So the network will also um, produce for you a proof that they are actually storing the data behind H that, so you can maybe turn around and show it to some other blockchain. All right, so going back to our roll-up story, um, we're the, the roll-ups are storing off-chain transaction lists, so they will be actually writing the commitment to data on-chain, so as before, it was, it's, uh, the commitment to the data will be fully replicated between the nodes, but the data itself, the actual uh, you know, offline transactions lists are gonna be dispersed between the nodes uh, in the system. All right, so the commitments are on chain and the data is dispersed. Now, there are a lot of blows and whistles you can add to the system. And uh, some of the uh, interesting ones are you can set up incentives for nodes to continuously storing, store the data and incentivize them to be actually serving them to clients because uh, the way I described it, there are no incentives for nodes actually to respond to client requests upon, re upon reconstruction. There are actually ways, uh, very nice ways uh, to bake in those incentives. Um, you can also introduce continuous generations for proof of storage. You can ask this uh, network to continuously prove that they keep storing the data throughout the time. Uh, or you can do uh, other fancy stuff like proof of space or proof of replication. The stuff that I want to focus on in the remaining time is data availability sampling. Um, so what is data availability sampling? Basically, data availability allows a client to request random fragments from the nodes to probabilistically check whether the data is available, whether the nodes are storing this data. Okay, so we have a bunch of nodes. They're storing the commitment to the data and the fragment. And we will assume that the third of fragments uh, is enough for reconstruction of the data behind the commitment H. So as long as a third of the s servers are correctly storing, storing correct fragments, you should be able to reconstruct your original file. So data is unavailable if two-thirds of these nodes uh, suddenly become a Byzantine. Okay, if two-thirds of them are Byzantine, you don't have this one-third of nodes to reconstruct. So the sampling client, what it will do to check whether the data is available or not, it will query this network for a random fragment. And if this fragment come back correct, then you will know that the data is unavailable with probability one third. Why is that? Well, if the data is unavailable, it means that you know, one third of data may be, might be there, but two thirds is not there. And so you might be just lucky with your query and you hit this uh, one third of available fragments, uh, but you totally miss the fact that two thirds are absent. So every time you make a random query to the fragment, you get a probability of um, one third uh, that the data is unavailable. You can amplify this probability by making multiple queries. So uh, making a second query, you have now a one third squared probability of hitting the same third. And you can continue doing that after T samples, you, the data, you can be sure that the data is unavailable with you know, diminishing probabilities. The more samples you do, the highly is your assurance that the data is available if all the fragments come back correct. So people often confuse this uh, and uh, like wh why is it useful? Why is it just not, why can't you go away with just a signature from your service uh, saying that the data is, uh, that they store the data? Why do you need the data availability sampling? And it's actually the motivation is very, very interesting I find. It's kind of going back to um, our idea of uh, BFT versus longest chain style consensus. The initial motivation for studying this problem was to make um, blockchain 
more easily verifiable for light clients. So they get this additional assurance that the data is stored by the network. The light clients will be just poking at the network, asking it to send back random fragments. Um, so light clients this way will verify that the blockchain stores the data. So, but the more interesting motivation is that this method allows to build a longest chain style blockchain instead of BFT. So if you don't have BFT, if you cannot assume that your nodes are signing uh, stuff for you and are trying to reach agreement around whether they store the data, you can actually just verify yourself whether they're storing the data by just doing data availability sampling. Okay, so it's really useful if you want to build longest chain style consensus, even if you don't know necessarily the set of nodes that are running the blockchain and you don't have the BFT, you can still uh, achieve consensus around whether the network stores the data using data availability sampling, which is pretty remarkable. So, um, yeah, you can achieve agreement through sampling. So the original uh, design, kind of the motivation for light clients uh, was in the paper by Mustafa Al-Bassam, Alberto Sanina, Vitalik Buterin. And then uh, the most recent idea of using this for kind of longest chain Ethereum consensus. Um, okay, uh, I hope I'm citing correct, <laughs> correctly here, but uh, take this uh, with a grain of salt. It's very hard to figure out uh, on unpublished work who, who, who was first and who was second. But as far as I understand, the Deng Sharding proposal uh, from Ethereum was the first to kind of suggest this idea that you can use data availability sampling for um, achieving kind of longest chain style consensus for the blockchains. And the, I know there are people from EF, please correct me if, that, if that's not the case. Okay, good. Uh, right, so I want to get quickly just uh, go back to Ethereum and uh, kind of talk about how things it seems like are going to be evolving there. Uh, based on what, what are the current um, proposals are, maybe they will change or maybe they already are changing, I don't know, but that's what exact, uh, that's what kind of uh, what I was uh, figuring out from the, uh, from the discussions in the forums. So currently the Ethereum blockchain is uh, confirming about 100 kilobyte blocks on average every uh, 12 seconds. Okay, so the throughput of the network is eight kilobytes per second. And now uh, what Ethereum is trying to do is a really cool thing. They want now to expand their block to actually increase it by about 10x to one megabyte with proto Deng sharding IP4844. Uh, but this additional data that they want to store is this data that has the special properties. Um, it, first of all, so this is the data that the rollups are going to be using. It has an expiration, so it's going to, the validators are going to store it for one to two months, and then uh, they are free to delete it. It's not accessible to execution, so that's what this uh, makes this whole approach possible, that this data is not accessible to execution, so it can be uh, dispersely stored. Okay, so the special types of data is not accessible to execution. Only the commitment to the data is actually accessible and fully replicated. Uh, main users for this data uh, are rollups. And um, the initial, the kind of the first upgrade to Ethereum is still going to do full replication. So it's uh, only kind of get, gets um, them halfway there. So this additional, you know, uh, 0 0.9 megabytes is going to be fully replicated, and that will add about 100 to 200 gigabytes per validator, roughly. I don't know what the actual numbers will be, but um, this kind of an estimate. Uh, and uh, but this all, uh, this additional data will have all of these properties. It will expire. It will not be accessible to execution, and it also will be cheaper, uh, just because. Uh, you know, the executing clients won't need to access it too often. Uh, this block, blob, called blob data is gonna be much cheaper than the cheapest data. The cheapest data is call data, stuff you pass uh, uh, inside your transaction as an argument, yeah? So the blob data is gonna be one gas, whereas call data is currently 16 gas per byte, I think. All right, so it's uh, gonna introduce some new kind of data that's uh, cheaper. And then, uh, hopefully, <laughs> uh, by the way, I want to mention that uh, the use for homomorphic commitments, Ethereum uh, plans to use KZG commitments, and for that, uh, if, you, if you know what they are, you need a trusted setup. And Ethereum is running a trusted setup, especially for those homomorphic commitments used uh, here. So if you want to participate, 
uh, check it out. It's a, it's a good time. And then the plan is to go to full data dispersal algorithm. So replace this full replication with data dispersal. And then you can maintain kind of the same burden on the validators. So they will be storing about the same amount. Uh, but since the data is now going to get dispersed between validators, you know, with efficient array recording, um, you will be able to increase the block size even more. Okay, so that's uh, kind of a final goal is to reach uh, 30 megabytes per, per blocks, at least uh, like um, th this how currently the parameters are set up. Maybe this will get adjusted, but that's the plan, I think. Um, and so you will get from eight kilobytes per second to you know more than 2,000 kilobytes per second uh, blocks, you know, without much burden on the validators actually. So that's pretty cool. Okay, that's uh, I think it. There are some disclosures uh, saying that none of this was an investment advice, and I was speaking on my own. But thank you. <laughs>